And as they're going out, uh, I'd invite you, uh, with the bulletins that you have, to take out your outline, to open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. I hope you bring your Bibles to church. I hope you've been marking up the book of Acts and reading through that as we've been going through this the last uh, while. And uh, we'll continue until we get all the way to Acts chapter 28, is where it all ends. But this is a great book of the Bible to look at who are we supposed to be as a church. The design is set forth right here in Scripture. It's so easy for us to get confused because sometimes as a church, rather than looking to the Word as to who we're supposed to be as a a church, we look to the next church over. And uh, we like to compare ourselves to other churches. Or if we perceive that another church is successful, well, let's do everything that they do. We need to always be encouraged to go to the Scripture. And so, in this particular passage today, Acts 13 and 14, we're going to be moving into a section, as we studied Acts before, which talk about the missionary journey of Paul. So here we are, Acts 13. It was a variety of weeks ago, we were in Acts chapter 1. Jesus gives these marching orders to the disciples just before he ascends into heaven. He says, and and power will come upon you when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And now we've come all this time, and it doesn't seem like the gospel has gone much farther than Jerusalem. It's gone a little farther but not much farther than that. And now God, who has already saved a man by the name of Saul, who in this passage becomes known as Paul, and people say, well, what is life? What's the condition? Saul and Paul. Well, Saul was his Hebrew name, and Paul was his Roman name. And it was typical at that time to have a Hebrew name if you were Jewish, and then a Roman name. But Paul was raised up to go to the uttermost parts of the earth as they knew it. And so it became very much more common for him to be known then as Paul. And folks, I actually think that since the beginning of the church that we see in the book of Acts, we are at a very key time to bring the gospel to the nations of the earth. So we've been talking about for more than a few weeks, you know, 3.2 billion people wake up every morning and they have not heard the name Jesus. That's why we're praying every Sunday morning this week for Lydia. They haven't heard the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Whenever we hear that, it should make us squirm a little bit and we should be asking ourselves, what can we do? Well, in these two chapters begins the missionary journeys of Paul there were three of them, and I hope that it begins the missionary journey of First Church as well. Because what we're going to see in just a little church in the city of Antioch, no big mega church, just a little church, the Bible records Antioch as a place where the followers of Christ first became known as Christians, they send the first missionaries out. So, I'm going to direct your attention now to Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Now, in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a close friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me, Barnabas, and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. So today we're going to talk a little bit about missionaries, missions, and what that's all about. I have to admit, in the last 20 years, the whole uh, idea of mission has really been rather confused. When I was growing up in church, you know, we would have missionaries come back and give reports to the church. And I went to a very small church, and I remember us having missionaries in Korea at the time, and they'd come back and share their experiences and how people were coming to know the Lord. 
So I always grew up with the idea that missionaries were people who went to foreign lands. We never heard anything about mission trips at that time, that people would take a mission trip. That's why the missionaries always came back. Then as I got older, people started talking about taking mission trips, where they would go to a foreign land, maybe for a week or two, and they would do something. Sometimes they help build something. Uh, sometimes they would help lead a Bible school in a foreign country. Um, sometimes people would take them what they would call mission trips because there was a hurricane in Louisiana, and they would take uh, and they go on a mission trip or build a house after a hurricane in Texas. And so missions has gotten really clouded in terms of what it is. So I'm hoping this morning from the scriptures to remove a little bit of that haze because I think we as a church are called to mission work. And I also think as a church we're called to service work. And they're not necessarily the same. I think as a church we're called to evangelize and do outreach right here in Pella and in this region. And I think as a church we're called to evangelize and do mission work in foreign lands. And they're not all the same. So as we raise up missionaries, we have to ask, who are we, in fact, raising up? And as we do mission work, what actually are we doing? Well, the first thing we need to know about missionary work and missions work is that missionaries are always sent out by the church. And the church sends out their very best to do the work of God in a foreign land. And so, right now in the church, this church, I believe we're raising up leaders. And that needs to be a focus of ours, really forever, to raise up leaders. You say, well, where are we raising up leaders? Is that that commission passage that you talk about? Well, it could be. So we have five people, five individuals right now who are in a commission pastor program. And they may serve as some level of pastor in this church. Maybe they'll go to another church and serve in some capacity as a pastor. Maybe they'll be raised up to plant a church. Maybe they'll be raised up to go to another country. But praise the Lord, we're raising up leaders. So here's where I really want you to focus on. When I see all these people up here in the front a little bit ago, I wonder if there's leaders being raised up here to go to a foreign nation to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ somewhere else. I think we need to pray into that. As we send our kids to kids' class, you might ask the question, why are we doing that? Because we want to give them something to do while we're doing this. So we don't have to hear the chatter of children in the worship service. No, I believe we're sending them there is because we want to continue to see them become strong in the Lord and that one day, not one of them, not two of them, but many of them will feel the call to go to a foreign land and bring the gospel message elsewhere. That's what we need to pray for. Folks, 3.2 billion people not knowing the gospel of Jesus Christ does not require a casual response from the church. It needs to have an aggressive response. We need to be raising up people. And so we need to pray into both of these. And so as the church sends out uh, missionaries, remember it's the church, not mission organization. We are to be integral in the sending of missionaries. So if you go in the back corner of the lobby over here, you see a big little sticker on the wall of the world that looks great. I think there's eight little pamphlet holders up there. Six of those are missionaries that we actually support. I'm so grateful. Matter of fact, First Church has been lauded many times for the amount of money that First Church has sent to support missionaries in the world. Praise the Lord. Let's continue in that. But then let's also do this. When will come a day that there are people that are on that board that we've raised up from our church? So we're grateful for Bobby and Hope Quayle that are there because they often worship with us. Hope grew up in this church. They have now been in Cyprus for a few years and looking to go to England pretty soon to work with the Muslim community there. And so um, here we are as a church. And I would hope that one day all of those people that are back on that board are people that have risen up out of the local church and are now going to foreign lands. That would be an awesome day. That's the way it all started in Antioch. 
And notice from the first few verses that we read from this chapter, this all happened after they came together and they were fasting and praying. They fasted and prayed. They fasted and prayed, and then they sent out Paul and Barnabas as the first missionary. So I'm calling for a day of fasting and prayer on Monday, August 24th of this month. And um, I think it's actually Monday, August 22nd of this month. It's a Monday. So what are we going to do that day? Well, I'm going to call people to fast. By the way, fasting in the Bible is only ever done in the context of not eating food. We've kind of clouded fasting. Like, I'm not going to play video games for a day. Or I'm not going to look at Facebook for a day. Folks, praise the Lord for that. It's not fasting. Fasting is denying ourselves food. That's what we get out of the Scripture. And in this case, I'm going to ask that as many of us can do it, with your help in mind, that we fast for a day, we use that time to focus more on the Lord, and we pray. So we're going to come together, we're going to have a few times during the day where we can come together and pray, and then a bigger uh, gathering at night, and that we would pray. Why do we want to do it then? Well, a couple weeks right after that, we're going to kick off our fall, fall program. And you know, a lot of us, we love the fall program. We love on Wednesday nights when we see a line and 160, 180 people downstairs having dinner, going off to Squires, Cadets, the Bell Things, and all this. It's beautiful. But folks, we've got to ask ourselves the question, what are we doing it for? What are we doing it for? So we can go out in the community and say, whoa, we've got a lot of stuff going on over at First Church. No. We've got to be raising up people to go. Because remember, when we look at the Great Commission that the Lord has given to go, there's going to be those people who are going to be part of the sending process and those people that are going to be part of the going process. Sending or going. But we need to be raising up people to do those things because we have to be gripped by the mission of the Lord to go and bring the gospel to other nations. And so that's what we're going to do on the 27th. And we need to pray earnestly for that. Go back to the Bible. Acts 13, verses 4 and 5. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. Arriving in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. They also had John as their assistant. Now, I want to give you a little Bible tip here. In many people's Bibles, even if they're not study Bibles, see in the back of my Bible, you can't see this from there, but you see that it's colored. We have maps in the back. Maps! It's kind of amazing what people know about geography anymore. We were recently in California, and the guy, when I said we were going to Iowa, he said, oh, that's right about California, isn't it? I said, no, not exactly. It's in the middle of the country. Oh. Oh. You mean Ohio. I said, no, Iowa. Anyway, he obviously was sleeping through fifth grade. So, folks, I love keeping a map nearby when I read the Bible, because what happens is it's good to know the geography of things, okay? And so when you read these different towns, you wonder, well, where are they? Well, basically today, today, when Paul goes to the island of Cyprus, we can maybe picture Cyprus. It's an island there. There's Greece and there's Cyprus there. But then all the other cities, they're in what we would call modern-day Turkey, in modern-day Turkey. And so that gives you an idea of where the gospel is going at this time. Well, what do missionaries do? Well, minister, missionaries teach the Word. There was a methodology that Paul and Barnabas followed. When they went into a town, the first place that they would go is the synagogue. Well, the synagogue is where the Jewish people would gather for worship. And there were many in the synagogue who did not know or did not accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. But the synagogues were always looking for good Jewish teachers. Now, Paul was the best. The Bible describes him as having excellent training from a guy by the name of Gamaliel, and he could teach. And so he would go into the synagogue, and he would teach, and people would listen and hear him teach. And then many came to know Jesus Christ. Well, there are many churches today 
many churches today. Well, they don't know what it means to be saved. They don't know what a convert is. They don't know what it means to go from this life leading to hell to a life going to heaven. And so we continue to preach to the church, and we say, church, this is what the gospel is all about. But really, Paul and Barnabas were fulfilling what Paul later said in the book of Romans when he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew, that's why we go to the synagogues, and then for the Greek. And Greek can be translated Gentile there as well. And a Gentile is anybody who's not Jewish. So, here's one of the first conditions of being a missionary. Grace yourself to this. When you're a missionary, you speak the Word of God. Sounds so far, right? When you're a missionary, you speak the Word of God. I want to tell you, I've been to mission places, places they call them mission places, where they actually said this. We want to do as much as we can without ever having to speak. We want to do it in the name of Jesus, and I say, well, how do they know about Jesus? Well, they'll know about Jesus because of the good things we do for them. But no, 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 no. Nobody really ever comes to know Jesus by the things you do for them. They need to hear the words of Jesus so that they can respond to the words of Jesus and come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So don't let everybody, anybody ever tell you that it doesn't require saying anything about Jesus. In order to be a missionary, you have to say the Word of God. That's so vitally important. That's what Paul and Barnabas did. That's what we're supposed to do. We say, well, Pastor Bob, well, there are people that go to other lands and they build a medical clinic. Back there on that wall, we have the Bebouts from Knoxville. They're over in the chair. They built a medical clinic. Uh, she's a doctor. Wonderful, wonderful people of God. They built a hospital. We've helped them build that hospital. I assure you, they talk about Jesus. It's just not building a hospital. But if we just build a hospital and we don't talk about Jesus at all, we're not missionaries. Well, what about if we go to another nation and we help them become better farmers? Well, if you help them become better farmers and you don't talk about Jesus, well, you're not a missionary. You're a farmer. We're going to only be missionaries when we talk about the Word of God. Vitally important. Let's go back to the Bible. Acts chapter 13, verse 6. When they had traveled the whole island as far as Papas, they came across a sorcerer, a Jewish false prophet named Bar Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, that is the meaning of his name, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, stared straight at Elymas and said, You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You, son of the devil, an enemy of all that is right, won't you ever stop perverting the straight paths of the Lord? Now look, the Lord's hand is against you. You are going to be blind and will not see the sun for a time. Immediately a mist and darkness fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then, when he saw what happened, the proconsul believed because he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. It's a little fascinating piece of scripture. You know, Luke is writing the book of Acts, and I think, well, could you get this straight before you wrote it all down? You're a little confusing. Because first he introduces a man by the name of Bar Jesus. Bar Jesus is not an uncommon name for the time, Bar hyphen Jesus. It would also, it would be seen as son of Jesus. Jesus is a common name. Jesus is also translated gospel, son of Joshua. Well, then a couple verses later, he refers to him as Elias. And so it's been kind of confused the, the readers. Well, Elias, who's Elias? Is Elias part Jesus? Elias is part Jesus of the same people. And then he also says, now Saul, now also known as Paul. <laughs> so, same people. Elias and part Jesus, Saul and Paul. What's going on here? Well, you know, as missionaries go out, they're supposed to be guardians of the truth. Sometimes when you go into a foreign land, you find out that people might believe all sorts of different things. Well, here they go into this place, and this man, Elimus, he's Jewish. 
And yet he's practicing sorcery. Well, he knew better than that. You don't have to read very far in the Old Testament, of which is what they had their hands. That sorcery is not of God. All these little magic tricks are of God. And he's doing that. And of course, that upset Saul and Barnabas. They needed to be guardians of the truth. And then there's this other man in the story. He's a proconsul. His name is Sergius Paulus. And so, what does he do for a living? Well, he was a governor of the province of Cyprus. And uh, he's listening to the gospel. He's listening to the gospel. There is the audience. We've got one guy over here named Elymas, and he has a response to the gospel. He's perverting it. And we've got a guy by the name of Sergius Paulus over here, and he's actually listening and ready to respond. Well, what happened is, is Saul, Paul now, and Barnabas, they had turned to Elymas and said, stop doing what you're doing. And if you look at the words that you use in the scripture, he uh, is pretty direct. See, folks, we can never be hesitant for those who are going to take the gospel and twist it into something else. We should never be hesitant to say, that is wrong. That is wrong. That is going to lead people astray. And here's Church of Paulus was listening to it. And then in the midst of this, this miracle, so to speak, because it happened because of God, Elymas' eyesight was taken away. The Bible says, for a time. Because all of your sorcery, all of your tricks, they mean nothing. God's got all of this. And just to show you, your eyesight is going to be gone for a while. And that's from God, not any magic trick. But then it says, Sergius Paulus believed. And did he believe because there was this great sign that was there? No, look at what the Bible says. He believed because of the teaching of the Word. Remember when Jesus came and He did miracles, He didn't do miracles to replace His Word. He did miracles because it supported it. People's lives would be changed not because of the miracles, but because of the very Word of God. And so we need to continue to preach the Word of God. And... This is what happened with Sturgis Paulus. People believed the teaching. Now, in the ne- next section of the a big long sermon that Paul gave, and we're not going to go through that right now. Now, but basically, in this sermon, what he does is he presents the gospel. He goes back and he basically gives a whole Old Testament history. He talks about God saving Israel from Egypt. He talks about putting up with them in the wilderness. He talks about the judges. Basically goes through the Old Testament. He talks about getting them Saul, King Saul, and King David. And then also he leads that right into all of this leads to Jesus. And it was a call to believe in the gospel, to believe in Jesus as their Savior. What I want to talk with you right now is to Acts chapter 14. 14 verse 1. In Iconium, they entered the Jewish synagogue as usual and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they stayed there a long time and spoke briefly, or boldly, for the Lord, who testified to the message of His grace by enabling them to do signs and wonders. But the people of the city were divided, some siding with the Jews and others with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat and stone them, they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian towns of Lystra and Derby and to the surrounding countryside. There they continued preaching the gospel. The church remains determined. You know, last week when we talked about chapter 12, at the very end, Harry had done some terrible things, and Herod, of course, lost his own life. But at the very end, it says the gospel continues to move forward, to increase and multiply. Here we are, church, 2022. 2022. And one of the things we're here for is to continue to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter what happens. What happened in this chapter? Well, we see in verse 1, they taught the word, many believed. 
What do we see in verse 2? As soon as they started teaching the Word, some people stirred it up and caused division. That's what the devil always wants to do. The devil wants to cause division. And, oh, there is such division going on out there in the church. People want to cause division. Oh, you're not doing this, or you're not believing this, or this, or that, or the other thing. When we stick to the truth of the Bible, let's stick to the truth of the Bible and continue to move forward. Well, some people leave, some people will leave. But let's stick to the truth of the Bible. In verse 3, even after there was division coming up, they stayed and they boldly preached the Word of God. And then what we see in verse 6, things got so heated in town, they actually wanted to take them out and stone them. They found out about that. So as Jesus had already said in his teaching, they basically took the dust off their feet and they went to the next town over and they continued to do it all over again. It would be easy at that point to say, Wow, this group of Christian missionary is really tough work. Let's go back and work for Calvary. But some, some people always want to take the easy way. When God calls people to be missionaries, and God calls people to a foreign land, you know, the mission organizations that are out there, and they're serious about people bringing the gospel to a land that doesn't know Jesus, they say, folks, this is never a short-term commitment. This is a long-term commitment. It's going to take a long time for you to learn the language, learn the culture, and continue to bring the Word of God. But when will I be able to go back and my kids get to go to an American school or I get to do this, 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 and this? Probably not. Being a missionary is something way more. And so there is oftentimes difficulty involved with it. And there's suffering involved with it. But this is what the missionaries saw and Barnabas were prepared to do and what we're called to do in this day as well. And so as these things happened, as they were teaching in these towns, many people became saved. What were they preaching? They were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to be saved. What are you going to get saved from? You're going to get saved from the wrath of God. The wrath of God. See, unless we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, unless we put our trust in Him, then what comes at the end of our life? It's hell. It's real. It's real. That's why we're saved. Okay, you say, what about the love of God? Of course the love of God. For God so loved the world that He gave His Son so that we could be saved. I heard this quote this week. It's quite profound. We have emphasized the love of God so much beyond the wrath of God that we've already got our air conditioned. Think about it. And when people think about an air conditioned hell, they think, well, it can't be that bad, right? Well, it's bad. It's not air conditioned. It's bad. That's why we give up everything and we go and we tell the gospel to other nations so that they can receive the Word of God. The church then and the church now will face opposition. When the opposition goes to the point that their lives are threatened, they went on to another place. Now let's skip over to verse 19 as we finish up. Some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and when they won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. After the disciples gathered around him, he got up and went into the town. The next day, he left with Barnabas for Derby. After they had preached the gospel in that town and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening the disciples by encouraging them to continue in the faith and by telling them it is necessary to go through many hardships in order to enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church and prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord to whom they believed and believed. They passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. After they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Apollia. From there they sailed back to Antioch where they had been commended, commended to the grace of God and the work they had now completed. After they arrived and gathered the church together, they reported everything God had done with them and that He had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a considerable amount of time with the disciples. Wow. So I just picked up at verse 19, and what happened to Paul? He was stoned. By the way, that doesn't mean he'd been drinking. He was stone stoned. 
So, folks, stoning in that day was one of two things. When they stoned people, sometimes they just pushed them off a cliff into a bunch of stones and they died that way. And then other times, they put them against the rock pile. People would pick up rocks and they would throw rocks at them and left them dead. Well, God obviously had more for Paul to do, so he did not die in this state. But I can't imagine how injured he was and how he picked himself up with the help of others. And they ended up going back to Antioch to report on what God had done. Because in Paul's mind, here's what needed to be done, but that, that, that the heart of Gentiles were open to the gospel. That's how he determined he was. I sometimes think, oh Lord, help me not to be a wolf of a Christian. Help me not to be a wimp of a Christian. Look at Paul. He had stoned. Who would say to Paul after that, you need to get back out there on the field and say, Paul, you've done enough. Let somebody else do it. But Paul picked himself up and he continued to be much, much more. But as we close, here's the thing. I left one thing off in the outline that I want you to write in. It says, we are all missionaries. And then I want you to put question mark, question mark, question mark. Because this is a little confusing for some. I really believe that if we're going to be missionaries, we're going to go to a foreign land, folks. I believe that's what the Bible speaks of. If we're going to be missionaries, we're going to go to a foreign land. Well, can I be a missionary in Pella? Well, it's not really being a missionary in Pella. Of course you share your faith in Pella, or your faith in Pella. But when you go to a foreign land, that's when you're a missionary. You will be sent to Judea, Samaria, and the world. And here we have the first missionary report back to the sending church. They came back. They reported. Well, what is the goal of a missionary? Well, converts. Well, converts don't always come right away, but that's ultimately the goal. We bring the gospel to the people, turn their lives over to Jesus Christ. And there's so many stories you can read about missionaries in the past where the converts didn't come right away, but they came a whole lot later. Sometimes they're painful stories because they think, Lord, they've given up everything. They've gone through so much. Give them some fruit. God says, continue to preach the gospel. You might not see all the fruit in your lifetime, but continue to be faithful, continue to be obedient, and there will be fruit, I believe. And then there were new churches that were started, new communities. It talks about appointing elders in all these places so that these churches would be able to grow up. So mission work isn't just about conference, but there needs to be conference. Mission work just isn't about community, but there should be community. And then ultimately, what do missionaries do? This sums it up. They preach the gospel to those who haven't heard. They disciple the new believers, and they help establish new disciples and churches. That's what a missionary does. That's what we've got missionaries doing. So there's a whole lot of other things that can go out there that are called mission work, but this is really what a missionary does. As we seek to raise up new missionaries, this is what we're going to ask them to do. We're going to ask them to preach the gospel to those who have never heard. We're going to ask them to disciple the new believers. And we're going to ask them to begin churches. That's what we, that's what we do as missionaries. And we're either going to be a part of the sending or the going. And I hope we're part of both. And so even as we're raising kids, as we're encouraging our young people, as we're encouraging those people around us, Let's encourage them to be missionaries. And who knows, maybe it's you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we bless your name and we thank you, Lord, for this portion of your word that calls us to a mission much bigger than ourselves. Lord, I confess that sometimes I want it to be comfortable for myself. And so we confess that together as a church. And yet, Lord, you call us to a bold mission, a bold mission that takes us places that aren't comfortable. But this is why we're here, to proclaim the Word of God to the entire world. So I pray even as we hear the voices of children coming in in just a moment, that perhaps some of them will be called to be missionaries. I pray that amongst our young people and young adults, that some of them would be called to be missionaries. I pray that you would raise First Church up to be a missionary-sending church. And 
which means we support them financially, support them with prayer, support them with our encouragement, and to do whatever is necessary to see the gospel go to the 3.2 billion people who have heard the gospel. Oh, we love you so much. We thank you for strength for the journey that comes through the wonderful supper that you have given to us. 